Good afternoon. Welcome to PubMed Search Like a Pro. My name is Carrie Price and I'm an informationist at the Welch Medical Library. We have a lot to cover today. I'm guessing that some of you are already familiar with PubMed and the poll that I put up in the beginning looks like many of you have used it and have some familiarity with it. It's a platform maintained by the National Library of Medicine and the National Center for Biotechnology Information, and it contains over 30 million records. So when you're searching in PubMed, it can be really hard to find what you need with 30 million records there. Uh, the bulk of the content in PubMed comes from a database called Medline, and that's a bibliographic literature database. A word of note, you should always access PubMed through the Welch Medical Library or the Sheridan Library's website instead of through Google so that you are recognized as a Hopkins affiliate. You don't have to sign in to anything. You don't have to pay for PDFs or log in to sites. If you go in through our website, you'll be logged in and you'll be able to access PDFs through our catalog. So like I said, this session is being recorded. And the screenshots in this webinar are both from Legacy and New PubMed. It's currently in transition from an old platform to a newer platform. Really the biggest difference is the aesthetic look and feel, not so much the functionality, but you might see some things that look a little bit unfamiliar to you. My colleague Ellie is monitoring the chat for questions and so feel free to type into the chat. We'll stop, we'll take your question and we'll also make time at the end of the session for live questions. So most of you are muted for now. You'll have time later to unmute yourselves uh, and talk. Today's objectives are as follows. We'll look at the benefits of having an NCBI account, understanding the differences between medical subject headings and keywords, understanding how to apply field tags or search in certain fields for an optimal search, creating an effective search using both MeSH terms and keywords, establishing a search alert, applying search filters, locating similar articles, collecting your results for later use, and identifying major differences between legacy and new PubMed. So it sounds like a lot. Hopefully it's not too much. I think we'll be able to get through it all. My first goal for you is to get you set up with an NCBI account. So yesterday or early this morning, you should have received email instructions from me on how to complete this task. And if you didn't, these slides will be shared after the session. The instructions are listed here. You'll need to go to PubMed, register for an account, confirm your email. And the reason I recommend having an account is because it allows you to do more than you could without an account, such as save your searches and come back to them later, save your results and come back to them later, set up alerts, customize your viewing settings, and create a bibliography of your own works, which can be integrated into other platforms like ORCID. So once you're set up with an account, it's time to start searching. My second goal is to have you understand the difference between medical subject headings and keywords. This can be a little bit tricky, so we will approach it carefully. Medical subject headings, or MESH, may sound familiar to most of you. Medical subject headings are a list of master subject headings in PubMed used to index records and make the content more discoverable to the user. It works a little bit like a standardized hashtag. So if you're a social media user and you've searched Twitter or Instagram for hashtags, you can start to understand how mesh terms work. So there are some downfalls to mesh terms which will affect your searching and you should know about them. First, they don't get applied in a consistent or timely manner. They're applied by humans at the National Library of Medicine, and there's always room for error. And there's a lag time from when an article gets published to when it gets assigned mesh terms. And anecdotally, this can be six months to a year. There are some records that are considered out of the scope of Medline and will therefore never get indexed. And finally, there aren't mesh terms for every topic. So a very new or trending topic may not yet have a mesh term for it. Mesh terms are released every year by the National Library of Medicine, and so more modern terms get added on an annual basis. But mesh terms can help you account for ambiguity. So let's say you were looking for retention. There's a mesh term for urinary retention. There's a mesh term for staff retention. Big difference, but it'll be able to help you make that distinction when you're searching the literature. And it can also account for variations in spelling. So 
words like behavior and tumor in British English have a U. And if you didn't search that way, you wouldn't find them. But using the MeSH term will help you find that literature if it's assigned a MeSH heading despite or regardless of the spelling of the word. So with all that in mind, if you are searching for literature using only MeSH terms, you're likely to miss the most recent literature, the literature out of the scope of Medline, or that has never been indexed, or literature that may be peripherally related but is still of interest to you. So to account for what you might miss by using MeSH terms, we searchers recommend using additional keywords to capture the most relevant, most recent, and most topical literature. With over 30 million records in PubMed, consider that not every author will refer to a concept with the same terminology. And I'm sure that in your field, you're dealing with acronyms, synonyms, abbreviations, and variations in spelling. So for any search topic you're interested in, you'll need to brainstorm additional terminology. You can also use keywords when no, no mesh term exists for your topic. And before I move on from this slide, one minor note, that will hopefully not affect your searching too much, is that if you enter your keyword without quotes like you might in, say, Google, PubMed does something called automatic term mapping. And usually it works great. It's trying to map your terms to the subject headings that it thinks you want to see, but sometimes it's wrong. So to turn off automatic term mapping, you can simply enclose your term in quotes and it will be searched exactly as you entered it without any mapping. So, whew. We're going to show all this in live uh, in real time later on if I if I can make that happen. So if you don't get it yet, you will when we have a chance to look at PubMed. So to search with MeSH terms, you can locate the MeSH database from the PubMed homepage on Legacy PubMed. It's under me More Resources and on New PubMed, it's under Explore. Now let me see if I can bring up a browser here. Everybody seeing my browser, the Welch website? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thanks for the confidence. Okay, so here is our Welch Library website. Our literature databases, our most popular ones, are here on the left. We have PubMed, Legacy, PubMed New. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. Like I said, their, their functions are largely the same. I'll go into PubMed New. And Mesh lives here under Explore. So we click on the Mesh database. And it's going to take you to the old look and feel of, of what PubMed and the other related databases look like because they haven't made updates across the board. So we'll just start with that. And let's talk a little bit about how you would use Mesh, how you would search for Mesh. So you locate the MeSH database on, in, on the PubMed homepage. And remember that when you're searching for MeSH terms, you're searching for subject headings, not for literature just yet. And when you find an accurate term, you can take a look at its record to make sure that it's what you want. Click Add to Search Builder on the upper right-hand corner and click Search PubMed. So now let's take a look at that. So the example I've chosen today, I want to look up Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And you see as I type, it starts to auto-populate some suggested terms. I'm going to choose Ehlers-Danlos disease. And I actually see that the subject heading for this condition is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There's a definition, so you could check in case there were any ambiguity. There are subject headings, so these are going to narrow your search down and search based on subject headings assigned to the record. You can restrict this term to a major MeSH topic, so it would be recognized as a major topic in the record. And you can also do not include MeSH terms found below this term in the MeSH hierarchy. And what that means is, let me scroll down. This actually happens to be the narrowest term in the MeSH hierarchy, but if we went up one level to say hemostatic disorders, we would scroll down and see that there are actually a number of conditions that fall under hemostatic disorders. So you can turn that off by clicking do not include mesh terms found below this term in the mesh hierarchy. Let's go back to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Let's say I wanted to search with this term. Oh, and I forgot to mention these entry terms. These are terms that if you type them in PubMed without quotes, it would map to this subject heading. So if you typed in cutis elastica or Ehlers-Danlos Ehlers disease, 
it would map to this subject heading. So you can see that it would work pretty well in most cases. So we're ready to search with the subject heading. We can click Add to Search Builder. And it comes across in quotations with the mesh tag attached. And so you didn't really need to type anything at all. All I did was click Add to Search Builder, and then I'll click Search PubMed. So I get 3,177 results with this subject heading. But let's talk about searching with keywords. Oh, that's a screenshot in case my internet were to fail me, which seems likely. So there's the mesh database, the, the subject heading itself, and then adding it to the search builder. Let's talk about searching with keywords. Keywords allow you a little bit more flexibility because they can really be whatever you want them to be. So here are some tips for searching with keywords. In addition to enclosing your search term in quotes to turn off automatic term mapping, quotes also tell PubMed, and in fact, all databases, to search your terms together as a phrase. In the timely example given here, using quotes around acute respiratory distress syndrome allows it to be searched as a phrase rather than searching acute and respiratory and distress and syndrome. So some of those might be in the title, some in the abstract. It would be a much more sensitive search with a higher recall and a lower precision. Next, you might choose to employ field tags, although this is completely up to you, and we're going to look at them a little bit more in depth in the next part. Uh, the default for searching PubMed and is all fields. So if you just entered some words in the search box, it would default to all fields in the record, which is usually the title, abstract, citation information, keywords, and some article metadata. Keep it in mind that at no point is PubMed searching full text. If you want to restrict your term to the title and abstract, for example, you can use the field tag TIAB enclosed in square brackets to search your terms only in the title or abstract and not anywhere else in the record. One note is that PubMed does not recognize punctuation like apostrophes or hyphens, so you can simply leave a space. Ehlers space Danlos will return Ehlers hyphen Danlos as well. Another key factor to becoming a pro searcher in PubMed and any database is understanding how to combine your search terms. The most common words used are and and or. So and you would use to narrow your search down. We're going to talk about concept searching a little bit later. You would use and between two opposing or different concepts. So let's say for today's example, we wanted to find literature about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and rehabilitation. We would use and between our Ehlers-Danlos terms and our rehabilitation terms. Or you would use to broaden a search concept. So in the example I just gave, we might use physical therapy or occupational therapy or rehabilitation or physiotherapy. Or it goes between synonyms or words within the same concept. And don't worry, we're going to look at how this works in real time before this session is over. Here's a screenshot. It might look like this if you're searching with keywords in PubMed. And this way we'll, we'll capture literature that might use any of these terms, which are all relevant to the topic of rehabilitation. So let's talk about field tags. You might also hear them called field descriptors. Field tags can be appended to the end of a search term or phrase in square brackets to allow you to search specific fields only. There's lots of tags, so I linked them here. You can review them on your own. But here are some of the most popular and commonly used ones. You can search in the title or the abstract title only. So for example, if you had the title of an article and you wanted to look it up in PubMed, you could search with a few of the title words. Mesh terms, text words, which is most of the record, uh, most of the data in the PubMed record, author, journal, and affiliation. So let's look at examples of how this might help you become a pro searcher. Let's say you wanted to see Dr. Pantelyot, who is a doctor at Hopkins, and his publications in neurology journals. You can search with his last name, Pantaliot, A-U, Neurology, T-A, which will capture journals with the word neurology in the title, and Hopkins, A-D, which requires there to be an affiliation of Hopkins in the authorship. That search returns three results. This is a screenshot from New PubMed. And you can see that Dr. Pantaliot is listed as an author, 
that the journals have the term neurology and that you can assume there's an affiliation of Hopkins, although to confirm that, you'd have to click into the record. And I just want to note here that your screen might look different than mine because I'm logged into my NCBI account when I took the screenshot and my custom filters appear on the left. So yours will look different and that's okay. Let's say you wanted to see publications in a journal, a specific journal. You can search with that journal's abbreviation or full name with the TA field tag. And don't ask me why it's TA. It doesn't really make sense to me, but it is. So you find the name or abbreviation of the journal and you can search with the TA field tag. Let's see what that looks like. The search results would be limited to articles published in that journal. And then down here on the um, past the screenshot cutoff, you can't see, but you can limit it to the year 2020 or whatever year you're interested in, and you'd be able to view records from that journal in that year. But if you're not sure what the journal is called or uh, how it's abbreviated or how it's really titled, you can look it up in PubMed's uh, journal NCBI catalog. Let's take a look at that. I'll pull up the internet again. Go back to the PubMed homepage. Um, it's under Explore. It's called Journals. So you can always look up a journal here. Let's look up PLOS One. And we see this is sort of all the metadata associated with this journal's record in PubMed and NCBI. But if we wanted to search with that, we can just click Add to Search Builder, and actually it, it does give you a different field tag, and then Search PubMed. Either TA or Journal will work. So we've got 228,000 some results that are published in PLOS 1. So we've covered creating an account, searching with MeSH terms and keywords, understanding field tags, and now we're going to look at creating effective search concepts using both MeSH terms and keywords together. So searching with both medical subject headings and keywords is the comprehensive searching best practice. It ensures that you capture not only articles indexed with MeSH terms, but also articles that are not indexed, not yet indexed, and articles that might have MeSH terms but no abstract. So it's a safety net for comprehensive searching. Let's think of our example from before. We found the MeSH term for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but let's consider that it may be spoken about in other ways in the literature, or that an article may not have a MeSH term attached to it. So we're going to search with additional keyword phrases. Note that I've combined them with OR, because they are within the same concept and I'm building the concept of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and trying to make it more robust. With both MeSH terms and keywords, my search is going to capture more articles and it will be a better search. Let's pull up PubMed again. Go back to PubMed. I, you can start here in the search box or you can start from MeSH, either one. I'm going to start from MeSH. I'm going to look for that subject heading again. and select it. And I'm ready to search with this, so I'll click Add to Search Builder, and I'll search PubMed. But we want to add some keywords now. We returned 3,177 results, and I know that none of you have time to read 3,177 results, but we'll talk about narrowing it down. So because I want to find literature that might not have a MeSH term, or that might use a different phrase, I'm going to add additional keywords with OR. So within the same concept, remember that PubMed doesn't care if there's a hyphen or not. And I put it in quotes because it's a phrase. Otherwise, I might find somebody whose last name is Ehlers and somebody whose last name is Danlos, and then it wouldn't be the kind of search I want. So note that I have 3,177 results with just the MeSH term, but since I've added some keywords, 
I, ha I now have 3,977 results. And you'll see that, let's see, we can sort by uh, most recent. And because we used keywords too, we should see very recent literature come up. And in fact, we do. We see April 21st, 2020. April 18th, 2020. So this is sort of a, a, a security blanket in searching that we're using keywords just in case, just in case there wasn't a subject heading on the record we're looking for, the records we're looking for. Um, navigating my, okay. So let's say you create a search concept for a topic that you're interested in, but then you want to narrow it down. So in the example we just looked at, maybe for Ehlers-Danlos and rehabilitation, let's say you were looking at something else and you wanted to find literature about maybe incidents, prevalence, etiology, or risk factors. You can create multiple additional concepts. And as long as you're in the same browsing session and your computer doesn't crash, your entire search history is captured under advanced. And this is true in both legacy and new PubMed. Let's pull that up. So here's my search. I've run a couple by now. I'm going to go to advanced. And I'll see the history that I've done so far in this session. And I could combine those if I wanted to. So I will, I will add a second concept in just a minute. But let's go back. So that's just a screenshot. So it helps to visualize a search or even sketch it out on a piece of paper. So in our example, concept number one would be Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and concept number two would be rehabilitation. And we wanna see where that literature, where those two concepts overlap. So take a moment to think about your own topics that you're interested in, how you might visualize them to build appropriate search concepts. Uh, people use PICO to outline this, which is population or problem intervention or exposure, con comparison or control. So they might help you figure out uh, exactly what it is that you want to find literature about. And uh, I, before I move on from that slide, this is just a two concept search. If you get really complicated, I've definitely seen three or more concept searching. So you're not limited to two, but that's a good place to start. You may have heard the term search string before, and this is what we're starting to develop, a multi-concept search that's going to ensure that we found the latest and the greatest. So if I fill this template in with our example, it might look like this, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and I put field tags for title or abstract, and rehabilitation or rehabilitation or physical therapy or physiotherapy. And in fact, I even said that as of two days ago, there were 91 results in new PubMed. So it's always a good idea to document your search somehow because it, it needs to be transparent and reproducible. And especially if you want to publish someday, a lot of publishers are now asking for your search strategies. And it'll save you time because I'm sure that you're very busy. You'll get called away from your search. You'll need to come back to it. And that way you won't lose what you've already done. So let's go back to PubMed. And we've run the search for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which was pretty comprehensive because we had both mesh terms and keywords. And I'm going to go back to PubMed, and I'm going to go back to the uh, mesh database and just look for rehabilitation. So you can continue to build concepts as long as you're in the same session. It's going to capture your search history. So feel free to keep searching. So I'm going to take rehabilitation. I'm going to add my well, uh, let's search PubMed. I get 300,000 results plus almost 400,000. I'm going to add some keywords. So they might say rehab or they might say rehabilitation or physical therapy. I'm putting it in quotes first to turn off automatic term mapping, second to search my phrases as a phrase. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to click search. 696,000 results. That's a lot. But 
Remember, we go back to advanced and we can combine our search concepts. So here we have um, number five was the one that had the best set of results. And then number seven had a great set of results. So in a new PubMed, it's a little bit different. So bear with me here. I think I can just type number five and number seven. So now we want to find literature that has either one of the words for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and one of the words for rehabilitation. So let's click search. Wow, 173 results. So we went from 30 million to a couple thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands, and then to a set of 173, which actually starts to look pretty good. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, I also want to take you back to advanced for just a moment and show you that if you aren't comfortable searching with field tags, you always have the option to pull down and search for people or things or words here in the pull down menu. So let's see, I'm gonna look for title, coronavirus and search. Hopefully it works. Oh, new PubMed. Okay, so what I just did was instead of appending a field tag to my search term, I just went to advanced search, entered the field I wanted to search, and I was able to find articles falling into that category, articles that have the word coronavirus in the title. Okay. So you have a search you like, and now what? We have to talk about establishing a search alert. And to do this, you do need to be logged into your PubMed NCBI account. You'll need to run the search you want to save and then click on create alert under the PubMed search box. This is the same in both legacy and new PubMed. And searches can be edited or ceased by logging back into your NCBI account and accessing the wheel icon on your saved searches to edit or discontinue the alert. Let's go to PubMed. Oh, sorry, let's go to advanced. Let's go to that set of 173, which had our terms for Corona, I'm sorry, our terms for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and rehabilitation. We'll go to number one. And let's say I am a researcher in this field and I wanna stay up to date on any new literature that comes out. I will go up here to create alert. It's going to log me in. <laughs> And I actually think I'm logged in because it, it gives my username up here, so I'm not sure exactly what happened. And if this doesn't work, we'll try Legacy PubMed. Oh, it works. So, huh. New PubMed has some wrinkles to it. And if this doesn't work, we'll go back to Legacy. Okay. What I wanted to see here were fields that were populated because when we just looked, it was blank. So it has a name here. You can rename it. If you'd like to give it a more simple name, you can do that. It has search terms. So if at any point you decide you'd like to change or edit those search terms, you can do that. And notice that it did apply parentheses for me. I didn't need to do that myself. And that happened because I built it concept by concept. I built one concept at a time, the first one and then the second one. And then it says, would you like email updates of new search results? You can say yes or no. You can get set the frequency, which day they come, how they look when they come to your email, and how many you would like at a time. And also send even when there aren't any new results. I personally have quite a few set up for myself. I get them weekly on Monday. And let me show you what that looks like. I'm gonna go back to Legacy PubMed because I know what they look like there. So to get into your account, it's in the upper right hand corner, my NCBI. And here are my saved searches. You can save searches and not get alerts, and that's how you would save in a search. Or you can save searches and get alerts. And to edit that at any time, you just click on the wheel icon. That's my search parameters, the name of the search. Yes, please, no thank you. Weekly on Monday, and I can save and I can go through all of my searches 
um, to edit them, and it helps me stay really up to date on literature that's coming out. So I like using the create an alert feature. Okay, the next thing we'll talk about is applying search filters. I want to show you how to apply search filters in a useful and efficient way. So let's say you did run a search and it had thousands or hundreds of thousands of results. And obviously you don't have time to even screen that, that number of results. So you'll want to narrow it down. On the left, you'll see a screenshot from the new PubMed and on the right from legacy PubMed. They both allow you to do essentially the same thing with some minor differences. And please note that in both cases, there are additional filters linked at the bottom. And I encourage you to check those out and play with them for best results. Speaking from my own experience, some filters are better than others. Filters you can use freely include date range, language, publication type, which will get you to things like clinical trials, meta-analyses, and systematic reviews. Filters you should use with caution include free full text. This is for people who are not affiliated with an institution and therefore do not have access to subscriptions. But you do, you're at Hopkins, so you do not need to limit the free full text. Also, filters like animal or human and age ranges are dangerous because they'll limit your search to only articles that are indexed with the corresponding MeSH term, like humans or uh, um, gerontology or geriatric or something like that. So therefore, eliminating it, it will eliminate all literature that hasn't been indexed with MeSH, which anecdotally could be up to 20% of your search results. So be careful when you're applying age or human limits although it's completely appropriate to do so depending on the scope of your project. Remember that if you are doing a systematic review, then none of what I just said applies, and you should definitely consult with your departmental informationist. Systematic reviews are by nature much, much more comprehensive than a typical literature review, and you wouldn't want to apply too many filters, and you'd want some guidance with your search. Let's look at using PubMed to find similar articles. In new PubMed, you'll see similar articles links on the right and on the bottom. This will take you to articles that maybe did not show up in your search, but that PubMed thinks you might be interested in. In legacy PubMed, similar articles appears on the right-hand side. The similar articles feature is a discovery tool to help you find additional results. So we've done quite a bit of searching. Uh, so let's talk about how to get those results, how to get to the PDF, and how to save your searches. There are a couple of things that you can do. In new PubMed, you'll see on any result or result list on the upper right-hand corner, you can save to a collection in your NCBI account. You can email it to yourself or others, and you can send to. By using send to, you can send it to a file for a citation manager or send it to the clipboard, which is what I like to do. It's a temporary staging area that will allow me to set the article aside, continue searching, and then when I'm ready, I can come back to my clipboard and export, save, or email the whole clipboard. So I like the clipboard quite a lot. Note that in new PubMed, um, you might not see, you might not always see an institutional link for Johns Hopkins, although I checked it earlier today and I did see a find it link. So if you're familiar with our find it link, I think we have set that up in new PubMed. Uh, I haven't had too much trouble getting to the full text as long as I am either on campus or logged into a VPN. And in legacy PubMed, you'll see the send to in the upper right hand corner, again, allowing you to email it, save it to a file, put it on a clipboard, and uh, then full text links through the Hopkins catalog. So here's our find it button, here's our full text link, and they would take you straight to the PDF. Let's go back, let's go to PubMed. I'm just, to get back to the home page, you can just click the search button. And I don't think I have any, um, searches in this PubMed. Let's go to the new PubMed. See if my searches are still there. They are. Okay, 
let's take a look at a record here. I'm just going to click on the first one. So here we see full text links through a publisher. We see the find it at JH link that'll take me to the catalog. Let's click on that and see what happens. If we have online access, which in many cases we do, you'll see Wiley on, or you'll see online access with the link to the online format. So let me click on that. Might have to log in. It took me right to the journal page and the PDF is right here. If we didn't have it available online, you would be able to request it through interlibrary loan, and that option will only show up when we don't have it. So this page, you would see an option for Welch Medical Library borrowers. You can request it through interlibrary loan. We'll request it from another library, and we'll send it to you in PDF format. So it's, and it's a free service to you. A lot of people don't know about it, but it's very nice. And then there are some cool things in New PubMed that don't exist in legacy PubMed, and that is the cite button. So you can say, well, I'd like to cite this in APA format, and it'll give you the citation in APA format that you can copy and paste into your presentation or your paper. And as you saw, you can actually toggle back and forth. Let's say we wanted to save this in PubMed because I'm logged into my account. Um, oh, these are just file types. That's the diff one of the main differences between new PubMed and legacy PubMed is how these buttons up here work. So um, you could get a file that you could then import into your RefWorks, EndNote, Mendeley, Zotero, or any sort of citation management program that you're using. You can email it to yourself. And because I'm logged into my account, my email is already populated, send email and I can send to. So here's the clipboard. I can just set that aside while I continue to browse and then eventually come back to the clipboard and then take it out somehow, either by email or one of the other formats. And my bibliography, I should mention, because if you are publishing and you are uh, working on your research, your, researcher profile systems like ORCID or ARIS or anything, or you're doing grants, you can set your own publications aside in My Bibliography and then have that platform integrate with other platforms. So it's a good way to kind of keep your CV up to date with the literature that's indexed in PubMed. And then I'm sure that a lot of you are, are using legacy PubMed. Let's just take a look at that. I'll just search with the most trending topic. I put it in the title only. So let's say, uh, let's say I wanted a lot of these results. I can send to um, collection and make a collection that will exist in my PubMed account that I can come back to later. I can send them to the clipboard. It'll add the first 500 items. I can send email. And if I do email, I can go up to 200, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways to then get your results out of PubMed for you to read, review, or save for later. OK. So last but not least, I want to identify some of the differences between legacy and new PubMed. Basically, new PubMed has a completely different look and feel. It's more modern. It's currently being updated more frequently than the old PubMed. Automatic term mapping works differently, although they haven't been able to describe or document exactly how that's working, but librarians have noticed that the automatic term mapping sometimes works differently. And according to the National Library of Medicine, new PubMed will become the default next month. So that's kind of scary for all of us, but in May 2020, the, you're only going to be seeing the new PubMed probably when you're linking from the Welch website. However, Legacy PubMed will exist uh, along with new PubMed for at least a couple of months. It's been around since 1996. Its look hasn't really changed too much since then, as you might have noticed. Uh, essentially, they're very similar. 
you might see some slight differences in your results. And I encourage you to leave feedback for PubMed. If you're using the new product, they've been very responsive to feedback. They want to have a product that works well for all of us. So let's go. I want to show you where that is. Going back and forth, back and forth. So if you run a, a search or you're doing something and you're thinking this just isn't working right, the feedback is down here at the bottom. And you can write to the help desk and tell them what your problem was. I did that the other day. I did a couple requests and they got back to me uh, personally. So that was really nice. And so practice makes better. Uh, you probably won't get your searches right on the first try, but feel free to reach out to me or your departmental informationist, and we're more than happy to help you develop an effective search. Now, in a normal in-person class, I would have time for practice exercises, but Zoom kind of changes everything. So if you have time later today or this week, I would encourage you to try some of the following. Try to identify a mesh term that you're interested in and search with it, and maybe add some keywords. Uh, try searching for an author or a journal that you're interested in, saving your search, creating an alert, and then looking for those find it links that are going to get you to the PDFs or emailing the results to yourself so that you can access them later. And so with that being said, it went a lot faster than I thought it would. We have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to open it up for questions. If there's anything I haven't covered, if there's anything you'd like to know about, I'm happy to try to cover it in our remaining 15 minutes. So. Uh, I'll, I'll do my video and you're welcome to unmute yourselves uh, as you need to. I am here for questions. Uh, Carrie, there's yes. a question in the chat. Does uh -huh. the new PubMed have a clinical query function? Yes, great question. I am realizing that this PubMed should probably be broken out into basic and advanced or essentials and advanced. Yes, um, I'm still sharing, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm on the like the new PubMed. And if I go to find, here we have a clinical queries tool. Essentially what you can do with clinical queries is enter any of the searches just like you would in PubMed. Let's just do a quick one, again, using our topic and rehabilitation. So I searched for Ehlers-Danlos and rehabilitation, just keywords only. I'll click search. And what clinical queries does is apply some pre-made filters for you so that it's taking you right to the higher levels of evidence without you having to look through a lot of editorial, um, more basic literature reviews. It's taking you right to clinical trials, so clinical study categories. And you can kind of toggle through here through etiology, diagnosis, therapy, prognosis, and clinical prediction guides. And then systematic reviews. So if you are familiar with the evidence-based medicine pyramid, systematic reviews of RCTs or randomized controlled trials, they're at the top of the pyramid. And so some of these might be a higher level of evidence. So clinical queries is a really great tool. It'll take you right out to the search results page. And then last but not least, there's medical genetics. So if you're looking at a condition that has a genetic component to it, you can browse the results that are filtered by medical genetics. Yes, that's a good one. I'm glad you asked that question. Anybody else? Anything in the chat? Oh, the slides will be available after class. I will make sure to send them out to you promptly this afternoon. And uh, if I don't have any more questions, I do want to share just a few more resources with you that I think will help you become an expert searcher. It takes time, it takes practice. So I've linked here the PubMed user guide. That's their help section, knowledge base for using PubMed the PubMed YouTube channel, which is mostly based on legacy. I'm sure that as time goes on, they'll come out with the, uh, the new PubMed tutorials too. And then our Welch Medical Library expert searching guide. So everything I talked about today, putting phrases and quotes, using and and or, we talk about that in our expert searching guide. And the Welch Medical Library nursing resources, PubMed help. We have a page on PubMed on our nursing guide. 
and the Welch Medical Library website, our research guides, get help, our service desk. And if I'm not your informationist, if someone else is your informationist, you can click on this last link here and you'll, you'll go out to our website and you can look up your department and find the person who is your informationist. And we're, we're all able to help you with PubMed, but I'm also happy for you to reach out to me. I want to thank you for attending this class today. Thank you for bearing with me on my technical issues. Of course, my computer works fine 100% of the time until I'm ready to teach a class. Uh, I hope to talk to you all again in the future. I hope you're all doing well. And um, I'll stick around for a few minutes in case there's any questions. But otherwise, have a great rest of your day. And thanks again for coming. Okay, hey, thank you, Carrie. Thank Here's you. Mike from uh, Wilmer, actually. Oh, hi. How are you? Okay, just always, always looking for a little, little edge. Yeah. A tough year. Yeah, I'm Trying sure. Trying to get everybody back up to speed and then bringing in a new class. I was planning on teaching Legacy PubMed today, and then I saw that it's, it's going to be new in May. So I. Now yeah. I ask you the question about the clinical queries because I saw it in Orlando. I got a sneak peek in the fall and uh, was wondering if they had, looks like they've refined it and done everything they wanted to with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good okay. time for, for clinical people. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, be, be safe in all this. You too. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.